My name is Ron Corbett and I'm a researcher in psychology at the University of Queensland and this video is here to describe a project that I'm currently researching. This will be the first of hopefully many videos on this theme. In 2011, under the supervision of Professor Bill von Hippel, I investigated the adaptive value of self-deception. This was based on research published in 2011 in a paper he co-authored with Robert Trivers entitled The Evolution and Psychology of Self-Deception. This video does not discuss that particular project, but a subsequent study aimed at honing in on some of the more interesting parts of that study. The study described here is neither published nor peer reviewed, and it was actually aborted halfway through. This is actually a really common thing you'll observe in many kinds of psychology research. We came to this decision to conclude the study after six months of data collection. We did a preliminary data analysis and realized we weren't finding what we were looking for. Now it's possible that our experimental design was not tapping the thing we were trying to look at, but it's also possible our hypotheses were incorrect. Naturally, we think it's more likely that the first of these two situations is the case. But described here for the benefit of anyone interested in psychology research, or potentially psychology reaches themselves, are the details of that study. Based on the publication mentioned previously, we thought that if self-deception evolved to deceive others, we ought to observe it in a context that our ancestors would have been familiar with. Naturally, my mind first went to combat and conflict between individuals. However, for obvious reasons, we can't ask psychology participants to come in here and beat one another as the way our ancestors might have done. But what we can do is develop tasks that are somewhat analogous to such situations. To that end, we asked participants to come to the lab and arm wrestle one another. We thought that if we could induce one of our participants to have an overconfident, really formidable sense of self, they might be able to intimidate their opponent, who had an accurate sense of self, into yielding more easily, to losing the competition, basically. The people who participated in the study were predominantly UQ psych students. We found individuals who didn't know each other, and then we paired them on their height and their weight. They arrived in the lab not really knowing what to expect. One at a time, the participants joined me in a separate lab. In this room, they were photographed, had their voice recorded, were primed, and photographed again. Participants were hooked up to a GSR machine, which I described as measuring their physical effort. They were then asked to lift a bucket of rocks, which weighed exactly 30 kilograms. The bucket, however, was marked as either 30 kilograms or 40 kilograms. If we wanted participants to have an overconfident and self-deceptive sense of self, we asked them to lift the 40 kilogram bucket, and I told them that their GSR data indicated they did it more easily than most people. If we wanted participants to develop a sense of self that was internally derived, we let them lift the 30 kilogram bucket, and I told them that the GSR data was pretty typical. Now we get to the fun part. Participants were returned to the first room, were read the rules of arm wrestling, and asked to walk into a separate room, sit down, and grasp each other's hands. They did this and were filmed doing so. Here, while they grasped hands ready to wrestle, I recorded their voices once more. During this whole period, they had ample opportunity to view one another, assess one another, communicate their own confidence, or lack thereof, and generally size each other up. This is where we expected the magic to happen. I counted down from three and they wrestled. Fights last anywhere between three seconds to three or four minutes. I asked them to fill out a number of surveys, which included measures on how generally competitive, aggressive, and socially dominant they were, as well as a very clever scale called the overclaiming questionnaire, which arguably measures their tendency to self-deceive. I separated them once again, took them to the separate room, and took a bunch of physical measures to try and control for these issues. Measured their height, their weight, naturally, the length of their arms, the, the circumference of their bicep and forearms, their grip strength when gripping something, and the number of curls they could perform on a 10 kilogram dumbbell. Participants were then debriefed, generally stood around to ask a bunch of questions for a while, and then left. So what did we find? Well, I'll skim over the full details of the analysis, but ultimately we didn't really find anything. In the broadest of strokes, we expected participants who were overconfident, who were self-deceptive, to basically be able to intimidate their opponent and convince them to yield more easily, to, to give up more easily. This didn't really appear to be the case. Participants were really evenly matched on all of their physical variables, and the only two that seemed to predict a difference in winning or losing was their grip strength and the number of curls they could perform on a 10 kilogram dumbbell. Now the question we need to ask ourselves is, did the prime work? Did the bucket task work? Well, we have good reason to believe it did. When we recorded their voice at the beginning, before competition, before they knew what was going on, and compared it to the voice recorded while they were grasping each other's hands about to arm wrestle, we found that those individuals who we induced to have an overconfident, self-deceptive sense of self 
lowered their pitch a greater degree than those who weren't. Now, statistically speaking, this wasn't quite significant, but we have good reason to believe that it was trending in the right direction, as well as the fact that the literature predicts that voice pitch is a really good indicator of dominance between men, and it interacts really dynamically between men in competition. So why didn't our study work? Well, the central premise of the study is that self-deception facilitates the deception of others by eliminating the cues associated with that deception. The problem in our study was that participants were required to arm wrestle one another. Any effect attributable to overconfidence, to self-deception, to creating this intimidation was likely washed out as by this no escape mentality. Participants were basically going to arm wrestle each other no matter what. Second, participants had a really high degree of insight into their own resources. They could walk in and after the competition began, gauge exactly how much effort they were engaged in competing with their opponent and they could observe its influence on their opponent. Their opponent likewise could observe how hard it was for them to resist and how effective they were at doing so. Importantly, this information was available to both participants and both of them were probably fairly accurate at determining how hard or how difficult this was going to be. Furthermore, if a participant wanted to pull out, it really didn't cost them anything to do so. In fact, even if they were losing, it probably paid in terms of saving face to continue resisting to the last possible moment without giving up. While intimidation may have occurred before the competition began, once it started, this was probably washed out by the reality of the situation. So why am I telling you about this? Why am I telling you about an aborted study that doesn't really have any meaningful results? Well, I think it's important people who are interested in science have access to how science occurs, and I personally think this kind of stuff is really interesting. Second, there might be some researcher out there interested in this kind of topic, and if they stumble across this video, I can probably save them six months worth of effort, or they can potentially improve on this study. If you are, just you know, contact me by email and we can discuss this. I'd love to go into more detail about our thoughts on this particular topic, but this is an ongoing line of research, and we're actually developing a follow-up study ourselves. When this happens, and when we find interesting results and hopefully get it published, I'll make another video on the same theme. In the meantime, if you're interested in finding the data for this study, seeing the other topics of research I'm currently engaged in, or seeing my other science communication projects, you can visit my website and just contact me from there. Thanks.